Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. My guest is Ursula Heitner. She's a university professor at the uh, Pioneer Institute of Microbiology, the Innsbruck University. And I'm probably going to be botching this, so I'm going to ask her about her background because she'll be able to explain it better. But uh, welcome, Ursula. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Ursula Peintner, so I got interested in mycology and nature when I was already a kid. I liked hiking and being outside in the forest. So I decided to start to study biology at the University of Innsbruck, which is close to my hometown where I grew up. And there I actually met Professor Meinhard Moser. He was a professor there when I studied, and he is one of the leading mycologists, I think, in, in the world, or at least at that time he was in the 80s. So I got into mycology because it was so fascinating what he was doing and how he was doing it. That's why I studied fungi, started to study fungi. Mm. Okay. And what's your research about today? What kind of questions are you trying to answer right now? Well, I'm still in fungi, obviously. <laughs> well, and fungi is a very big group, so so it's quite difficult. I would say, to say it in one, one sentence, I would say I think it has three levels. I studied the diversity of fungi. So first of all, you I think you need to know what you're working with, what, what you're dealing with. So it's systematics and taxonomy. And then I'm very much interested in the function of these fungi. So what are they producing? What kind of substances they release or they have in their fruit, fruiting bodies? And of course, this leads you then also to the question, what, what are these substances for? So I'm interested in interactions with other organisms from small to big. So from other, from bacteria, insects to plants. And of course, also among each other. So that's, that's the thing we are right. doing right now. Well, what's, what's your focus? Are you focusing on plant fungi interactions or what is your focus? Well, the focus changed a little bit during the last year. So I was uh, looking in the beginning, I was looking very much uh, in intensely at uh, interactions with plants. So uh, fungi do make this symbiosis called mycorrhiza and our mushrooms do the ectomycorrhiza. So you can see them and you can identify them and also kind of study the interactions and where to find them and if they are stable. Yeah. And then that got me also a little bit up higher because I'm living in the middle of the mountains. So we were interested how many plants, how important is this for plants? And we wanted to see if also alpine plants do have these ectomycorrhizae. And we were studying uh, mycorrhizae in the glacier fuel fields to see if and how far the, these uh, these go. And we found the the fungi very very far up 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 to three thousand meters elevation. As soon as you have plants, oh, wow. that's about ten thousand feet, right? That's great. <laughs> that's very about high. ten thousand feet. Yes. Well. So what's the can... what's the difference between mycorrhizae and mycelium? Uh, well, the mycelium is the major living 
well, the, the living part of the fungus. So uh, filamentous fungi grow in tiny hyphae, which then all together are called the mycelium. And the mycelium is dwelling and growing in the soil. And a part of this mycelium can interact with the roots. So they make a, a mantle around the roots. And they would then start to exchange different things. So, for example, the plant provides sugar to the fungus and the fungus provides nutrients like nitrogen, but also water and protection to the plants. So only a small part of the mycelium is having mycorrhiza and the rest is in the soil or is connected with other plants. So what is very nice, you have a big, big, big network in the soil. And this mycelial network can connect a lot of different trees with each other. And this is great because it's somehow like like big system where these plants can also exchange nutrients. So you can, for example, small plants, which, which are in the shadow and can't make a lot of photosynthesis. So they can't be, let's say, like they, they can't get a lot of sugar. They would get sugar from the big trees surrounding them via the mycelial network. And that's really fascinating, I think. Well, okay. So mycelium and hyphae and mycorrhizae, are they all the same thing? It's just what the uh, mycelium is interacting with or are they different? parts of fungi? Do they have different attributes, different structures? These mycelium, well, it's different parts of the fungus. So if we talk about a fungus like a bolid or a fly agaric, the main living form is the mycelium in the soil. And a part of it can make, make, make mycorrhizae and another part of it can make fruiting bodies. So they have different functions. Would pop up at different times. Well, yes. I, I've seen fruiting bodies, which are mushrooms. Or yeah. other polyps, but what does the transition between mycelium and mycorrhizae look like? What attributes do they have that are different from each other? Well, the mycelium is usually tiny, tiny hyphae, which are about one or two microns in diameter. And when they grow towards a root, they make a big mantle surrounding the root. So you can really see it. It's like it can be white or it can be yellow or black. And there are some, some, Struct, typical structures which are going away, high fan structures or something like this. So it's quite differentiated part of the mycelium. And you can so really... what properties, yeah, what properties does do mycorrhizae have versus mycelium? Like again, have, has anyone looked yeah. deeply into the structure and, you know, what, it's... what happens at like the terminal ends of the mycorrhizae? Do they have other specialized structures that touch the plants? So the, these, well, if I understand your, your question correctly, is how mycorrhizae look like or, or what function they have. Is this correct? Yes. 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 So the mycorrhizae, they have this mantle around surrounding the, the root tip. And then they have special hyphae which go deeper inside the, the root, but they never go into the cells, but go between the cells of the plant. And their walls of each of those two, both fungus and of, of the plant, get thinner so they can't exchange nutrients. So the mycorrhizae actually has more or less the function of exchanging nutrients between or exchanging water between these two partners. So it's the trading, actually it's the trading place. Well, not just water, but also nutrients, right? The interface of the mycorrhizae and the plant is where nutrient exchange occurs or no? Exactly, yes. The nutrients go both directions. So it's mainly sugars which come from the plant. So, so a lot of fungi, they mainly, mainly grow based on the sugar they are, the, which they get from the plant. And they provide nitrogen or phosphorus or all these micro, mineral nutrients to the plant. So I think that's, that's the thing which the plant is, is needing the most because these are limiting nutrients in the soil. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from $10 to $49 a month, including perks such as 
the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now, back to the show. Well, if you zoomed in with a microscope and you watched, you know, what happens inside the mantle next mm-hmm. to the plant, what would you see? Yeah, well, you would see that, well, they, they are tightly connected to each other and you would see a diffusion of glucose, for example, from the fungus to the, to the, to the mycelium, to the fun, uh, sorry, from the plant to the mycelium. You would, you could observe that. Okay. And another, does, does it act as a, um, are the sugars taken into the mycorrhizae and then distributed throughout the network or are the sugars yeah. broken down in the mantle? Like, does the mantle act as a stomach or does it act no. as, a, as a place where chemicals are altered and changed and digested or no? They are only slightly changed. They are packed into vacuoles and then these vacuoles are transported to all, to the rest of the mycelium. So it's mainly actually packing and transporting. It's like a post office where you, you get a parcel and then you bring them away where they are needed. Something like this maybe helps okay. to visualize. Well, in a mycelium network, are there nodes? Are there places that have different structure than mycelium? Or does it just look like a, a net? Um, well, the mycelium, I'm sorry, I had a, I, I hope I understood your question correctly because I had a bad connection. But the mycelium is definitely, has def- different structures. They have uh, hypha which serve for nutrients or they make in fruiting bodies, for example. So they make primordia where they will start in the fall, in, in autumn, in fall to, to grow up and make fruiting bodies like an amanita or a bullet or something like this. So that's, of course, a differentiation into different kind of tissues. And probably they also do vegetative propagation, forming mycelial fragments or, sp- or conidia or something or sclerotia, which help them to survive, for example, during winter, because we do have, uh, or also drought, periods where the plants don't provide nutrients. They have to survive, for example, the winter in the soil. Where right, but they... is there a, is there a, um, a part of the mycelium network that looks like, looks like a differentiated functional part? Or does it look like just a, a web of, of thin filaments and you can't know where it starts and stops? Yes. I think it's more or less like a, like a web of thin filaments and the, and it actually it's quite difficult to say where a fungus stops and where it ends and what is a fungal individuum because sometimes they also merge and it's too they can be very old several hundred years old and grow really big so yeah it's it's a big big fine net in the soil I would say which which grows every year a little bit more further on has yeah. anyone um, watched a spore start a new fungus and observed how it starts and how it grows from the beginning? Yes, you can, uh, of course, observe a lot of fungal spores w- during the germination and the formation of the, of the mycelia. You can't do that with all fungi. For example, um, obligate ectomycorrhizal fungi are difficult to grow from the spores. For example, Cortinarius. Rushola, they, they can't be really grown from the spore because they need some substances which the plants release to signal, here I am and I'm a partner for you. Otherwise, you can't grow them. So we know how fungal mycelia develop mainly from saprobial fungi. But if, if you have watched a spore germinate and turn into a mycelium, the original spot where the germination occurs, does it look any different from the rest of the mycelium? Or after a while, it all looks the same? You mean the spot? Well, the, the spore will be, uh, well, this, you have this spore and then you have a germ tube which grows out. Uh, and then the germ tube starts to septate make and making compartments. And sometimes when the, the fungus always grows its tip, so it would always grow longer and longer and longer. And uh, probably the cell walls of old fungi remain in the soil and 
at a certain point, they close the septa and they just take the cytoplasm in and then there is this empty, there's this empty hyphae which stay there. It's just the chitin which remains in the soil. So I think you could observe a difference from, from actively growing mycelia front to old places where the mycelium is quite old. Yes. And especially um, concerning the activity. Okay. Has, has anyone fluorescently tagged sugar molecules and watched them disperse through a mycelium network to try to figure out the structure of it internally or fluorescent? tagged other molecules and put them into a mycelium network? Yes, there is a green fluorescence pr protein, for example, where you can visualize the hyphal tip growth, which is very nice. Then you can really observe how the fungi or how the hyphal tips grow, how they divide, how fast they are, how many, how they take up nutrients. And you can, there's some possibilities to dye the vacuoles. So you can easily observe how they are transported. It's, it's usually polyphosphate vacuoles and they, you can dye them very nicely. And then you see how they are transported from the tip to other parts of the mycelium. This has been done in the lab, yes. But uh, mainly with subrobial fungi, which grow faster and grow easier. Because if you want to start... Is there a typical pattern to how the vacuoles or the molecules disperse? Do they go to preferred areas? Like, does, does the mycelium have a structure that we can't see with our eyes, but we could see if we zoomed in? Yeah, it differentiates. So, and what's interesting, the mycelium is kind of social <laughs> because the, if hyphae grow somewhere where there are lots of nutrients and other hyphae they are exploring in areas they don't have anything to eat or have no nutrients, they would supply the sugar to these areas. So, so you see that they are just moving around where they are needed most. So that's actually some kind of intelligence, which we don't really understand how it works, but, but they are somehow smart, these fungi. Yeah, it's weird because there seems to be no brain, no control <laughs> center, no organ. No, it's a very strange structure, it seems like. Yes, definitely. But um, maybe we can't imagine because we, we just can think with our brains. But I guess that they, there is some kind of other intelligence, which we just at the moment don't understand yet. There's also this issue of communication mediated between plants going on, which is mediated by mycelial networks, which they, which connects the, the different plants. So uh, we know that some information can uh, travel from one plant to the other plant via the mycelial network, but we don't really know yet how this works because we don't understand this kind of intelligence. I think it's it's an interesting field of, of research and hopefully we will once discover how this happens. Well, you said that uh, in a large established mycelium network, there's old parts and there's new parts. Can you tell the old parts from the new? Do they look different? Do they act different? Uh, well, the, well, you can definitely differentiate the new parts of the mycelium because that's where the hyphal tips are. And the hyphal tips are active. That's the, that's the part which is growing. And that's the part which, which is eating because fungi don't really eat by taking up some food like animals do but they do degrade the nutrients outside of the hyphae. So you can visualize that, that growing or active hyphae excrete enzymes, small acids or siderophores, which take up iron, for example. So you can see where the mycelium and where the fungus is active. That's where it's growing. Okay. Um, I guess going back to the, uh, the mantle, where the, the interface between a plant and uh, mycorrhizae occurs, um, what other activities are observed to be going on there? You said the, uh, it'll take in sugars, the mycorrhizae, but what kind of chemicals is it putting out? Do they, are they called exudates? Or what are the chemicals that are put out by um, mycelium or by mycorrhizae? And what are they called and what do they do? Well, the mycelia can, can release some different kind of structures or substances, compounds. 
not only in the fruiting bodies, but they do it also in the roots. So, for example, pigments, you would see them, mosaibe, uh, for example, is a cortinario species, which is making red fruiting bodies. And they do also form red myc mycorrhizae. And uh, one interesting thing is, why are they doing these pigments in the uh, on the root? And one possibility, or why are they producing special substances in the roots? And one hypothesis is that it's, this is partly to defend the plant or the mycorrhiza from feeding. There are lots of animals in the soil, like colembola or nematodes or, well, a lot of, or also bacteria, which would like to degrade, eat the mycorrhiza. And if a fungus or if the mycorrhiza produces some substances which, which are toxic, then they it's a protection function. I think a lot of them do have some protection function for the plant or for the whole whole mycorrhizal system. Yeah, but ha has anyone sampled the compounds coming from there to see what they are? I don't know if well this in, in vitro pos probably, but in vivo it's quite difficult because the roots are in the soil, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's quite difficult to to. First of all, to observe this in situ in the soil and also to, to sample the substances then from there. But yes, you can uh, have these mycorrhizal systems when you uh, have the plant and the fungus in a culture. And then you have one fungus and one plant and there you can do a lot of research, of course, to see what is produced and, and maybe what compounds are important or are released in the soil. Yes. Well, how does anyone know that um, hyphae that connect, or sorry, uh, mycelium that connects multiple plants are being used as a communication system? Is anyone looking at what molecules are going through the mycelium from plant to plants? You know, you would need to do that, I would think, in order to know that there's communication going on and what molecules are being migrated between plants. Maybe there's yeah. resource sharing. I don't know. Well, this resource sharing has been shown by radioactive labeling of substances, for example, from the from the plant, radioactive carbon, which was photosynthesized by the plant and then travels to another plant via the met network. That uh, has been shown like this. And the communication is uh, has been shown based on the response of the plant. For example, if you have a plant which is mycorrhizal and this has a parasite like a fungus, then usually these plants would start to defend themselves to have some kind of reaction. We do have immune reaction to, to get rid of this, this, this pathogen. And if plants connected via network, they would start to defend themselves before they even had contact to this pathogen. So they must have got the information from the, from via the mycelial network. But it's not probably, it's not clear. And I think it's not based on substances which travel from here to there. But it's, it's interesting. And a lot of books have been written about this topic and uh, movies are talking about it that the whole forest is one big organism. Everybody, every every plant is connected to the other one, and so we should consider this like like a big big habitat, and not as one plant which has nothing to do with, with the other ones. I think this is a very nice nice idea, which uh, which gives us a more a more complete picture of of a of a habitat or also of our surrounding uh, nature. Aren't there also bacteria? and nodules near the plant roots and do these occur inside the mantle of the fungi is there you know all these are there plant cells and bacterial cells and fungi fungal cells all in the same spot in the community yes yes exactly you are right uh, the soil is full with bacteria and full with organisms i think there is no other place uh, uh, anywhere than soil which is richer in in microorganisms. What is interesting that this this place surrounding the roots, which is called rhizosphere, is completely different concerning the composition of bacteria compared to the surrounding soil. That means that there is some kind of selection only like. 
the maybe the the good one. Only a selected group of bacteria colonizes the rhizosphere, and I think this this is due to the substances released by the mycorrhiza community. But uh, it's also a, a question of of um, transport. Uh, the fungi are are very nice because you have these networks in the soil and. The soil has a lot of hollow spaces because there's lots of air inside and some places are filled with, with water. So, for example, with, for a tiny bacterium, which is, which is a one cell, it's very difficult to, to, to travel around soil because they cannot jump over empty spaces. But fungi do have these mycelial networks, which are great because they are a bridge for example, over one of these holes. And a lot of bacteria now, we know, do travel along this hyphae. They have even been called, um, the hyphae are, are fungal highways, which the bacteria use for traveling in the soil, which is also very, very exciting because we learn that, uh, that there, everything is connected in nature. And we were thinking maybe, can every bacteria travel on this hyphae or are also here only a few bacterial groups allowed to use these highways? And in the last years, we have been focusing on, on these questions and we found that uh, there are selected groups of bacteria which are really enriched on the hyphal surfaces. So there seems to be some special tickets which allow only a few bacteria to, to, to travel on these fungal, fungal hyphae. And interestingly, these are the bacteria which are also enriched in the uh, rhizosphere. And from agriculture, we know that a lot of these are beneficial, called beneficial microbes because they release some, some hormones which help the plants to grow. So I think this, this is a very nice top uh, idea we are getting now that that in the soil bacteria fungi and plants are working together to make to make one symbiosis i think this is a great start right but again if you if you zoom in or you look or will you see um soil and then the fungal mantle and then inside of that root nodules and then inside of that something else or what does the structure look like near the plant roots are there multiple layers or you know has anyone looked at it yes there's lots of research um, on that because in the beginning the mycorrhizal research was focusing on the morphology so the, the, the mycorrhizae were described and named and categorized based on morphology and only later by it was possible to identify them now based on molecular me methods so a mycorrhizae actually is there are these hyphae which come from the soil and they, they bundle and make some hyphal strains which go, go to the root and there they form the mantle. And the mantle has a, can have a really a cellular structure and is formed from, by fungal tissue only. So, well, maybe some bacteria we don't know about it, but mainly fungal tissue. And this fungal tissue is surrounding the root, protecting it from all other bacteria. And making it kind of a hotspot. And only a few hyphae from the mantle go inside and do make this, it's called hardic net. Make the hardic net where you have this exchange between nutrients, water, and, uh, and so, on, and so on. Yeah. Very, very interesting. When going back to an older question I had again, if you, um, has anyone grown a, um, you know, a mycelium in a lab? And then, um, I don't know, let's say over a year's time. And looked at the original mycelium, you know, the quote unquote old mycelium versus the new mycelium where the hyphae is, you know, is growing and everything. And can they see the difference structurally or hmm. you know, chemically? I mean, has anyone looked to see what again, what does it mean to have old mycelium versus new? Are they any different? I guess maybe probably somebody has done it, but we didn't do it because we usually grow the fungi on plates. And this is the, the usual agar plates we do have with this, uh, eight or nine centimeters of diameter. And, uh, you would be able to grow them there for a while, but after a certain time, the plate is full. And, uh, 
the fun fungus is then starving and the mycelium would probably degrade, but you will definitely see that it's starting to degrade. It changes because if you get thicker walls, the change in pigment production, yes, there are some morphological changes going on between new, uh, well, young and old mycelium. But I don't know if anybody has ever observed it over really long periods, like months or year or something like this. Yeah, it would be interesting. Well, in the in the wild, in nature, as mycelium grows outward and forms a bigger and bigger network, mm -hmm. I would think there would be local spots where nutrients become depleted, yeah. and then the the localized, you know, mycelium would depend on the, you know, the ones at the edges to transport nutrients to them. But if the transport path becomes too long, perhaps the mycelium lets the original part die and then it continues moving. Maybe maybe there's a migration of mycelium networks over time based on resource depletion. That's definitely the case, I guess. Um, but of course, the, in the nature, you, you would always have a actually changes because you have need to nutrient depletion and then there is fall the, the you have again a lot of of leaves falling down a lot of nutrients coming in or deer coming by and peeing on the ground so the conditions are changing all the time and you have the seasons of course as well which are very important because for fungi at least in Austria where I'm from because we do have winter and uh, in winter we have snow cover so the mycelia would probably, well, most of the ectomycorrhizal fungi stop growing during winter. And next year they can recolonize the same areas, but I guess that the old mycelium will be somehow recycled. A lot of the, the old parts of the mycelium, which cannot be recycled like the chitin, like the cell wall, they stay in the soil because they are very important for, for, humus or organic matter, soil organic matter buildup. So I think you have a lot of old mycelia in the soil, which, which are just there and, and are forming organic, organic matter. Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering about that, all the structure, I mm -hmm. guess here in the United States in Oregon, supposedly the biggest mycelium network ever exists. <laughs> I guess it's supposed to be like miles, miles wide. Have you heard yes. about that? Oh, yes. This was a, a very old publication, well, old publication from the 80s. I think it was Anderson who published it because it was a, one of the first molecular studies they did to try to identify a fungus. And they ad identified this armillaria, which can continue growing as the oldest organism and the organism with, which is the biggest organism. So I think this is quite, quite nice and was a lot of publicity also for, for mycology because it made people aware that the fungi are there and they are in the soil and they can really grow old and really grow very, very big. Yeah, that's, that was a very nice story. I remember it. <laughs> but has anyone tried to sample some of the, uh, you know, the, the, the mycelium, the very old parts, the newer parts? Because this one, I guess, has been around for how long? Like thousands of years, maybe? They, they I think this work was based on, uh, well, they sampled the, the recent mycelium or the rhizomorphs of this fungus and identified it. And, and based on the, these techniques, which were very fancy then, but uh, a little bit outdated now, of course, identified the same individuum, the same species of fungus, over a wide area and but it's it was all based on recent mycelium and you can grow this fungus in the lab and you you can you can measure the for example the yearly growth rate of this fungus and based on that and based on the extension of the mycelium they they detected they calculated the age of the fungus but the old mycelium was not found because that's usually transformed and converted into soil organic matter. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering if we could learn anything. Um, do uh, mycelium seem to have an age or a biological clock, or do they just exist mm -hmm. forever? Well, actually, I think it's it's uh, it's a little bit depending on the species, a little bit depending on which fungus you're looking at. If you look at the at the real mycelium, 
or a mycelium of fungi which, which grow at the tip. I, th I think it's difficult to say whenever they die because they just grow. You know, the, the fungus, the, the mycelium is getting longer and longer. It can also divide and split because if you oh, if you have a road uh, which is built through this mycelium, it has some other kind of damages. You have two mycelia then. So maybe you have two individual, but it's difficult to say when it dies. The only exception is the yeast cell. For example, the yeast you use for brewing beer, Saccharomyces, because that one has this, has, has, uh, formed some kind of changes on the, on the surface where it can't make new cells. And at a certain point, it's all full with these scars. They, it, they are called scars. And then it can't bud anymore and must die. So yeast, like Saccharomyces, cerevisiae, they can die, but mycelia, I think you can not really, you can't really talk about the dying or mycelium. They live forever, essentially, or, or what do you think? Well, they can, a few fungi certainly do degrade, so the mycelium can die as a whole, but uh, we have cultures for, from, for, from fungi, which you tr always transfer to new plates so they are growing and growing and growing and a few you can really grow for a very long time 10 years 20 years so we don't know how long no, i don't know how long anybody has tried to transfer this fungi but i think they can grow mycelia can grow for a very long time yes okay very good um what's the best way for people to find out more about your research where can they go to talk to you or to, to read your papers? Well, <laughs> well, the papers are, of course, most of them are online, or you can find the the papers and my projects and research on ResearchGate, for example, or on the homepage of our university, where you find the publication list and the list of projects. Yeah, I think that will be the easiest way. So in, via the internet, or just come by and uh, talk to us or, or listen to a lecture which we are giving in mycology, I think that's also a nice way to talk, to have a little bit of more information about it. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Ursula, thank you for coming, and I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for uh, talking to me, and I wish you a nice day. Thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.